Okay, today's date's March 18th, 2013. We're in the district office of Congressman Kenny Marchant in Irving, Texas. With me today is Leroy Swan, Jr. He was born on August 9th, 1934. My name is uh, John Hayes and I'm on staff of Congressman Marchant. Mr. Swan served in the Army National Guard from 1948 uh, through 1950. United States Navy 1952 through 1959 and the United States Coast Guard 1961 through 1963 with the rank of Petty Officer Second Class. He served in uh, the Korean War era and the Cold War era. Well, Mr. Swan, thank you for coming in today. Tell me, did you uh, did you enlist? And tell me about the three services. Why? How did you get involved with three services? I got involved in the National Guard. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate that uh, and the opportunity to tell my story. I got involved in the National Guard through a gentleman at our church. He was in the National Guard in 1948, and the Arkansas National Guard was rebuilding after the Second World War. Uh, the Arkansas National Guard is the 39th Division. We were in the 125th Medical Battalion and headquarters and clearing company. I was 14 years old, and I visited. Uh, Harry Henson asked me to come out and visit the guard meeting. They met on Monday nights. They drilled on Monday nights. And I went out and I liked what I saw, so I talked to one of the recruiters and told him I was interested in joining. He said, how old are you? I said, I'm 17. And when were you born? I said, uh, 19, or, uh, he said, 31? I said, yes, 1931, which would have made me 17. So I officially was uh, enlisted, sworn in, and became a member of the Arkansas National Guard at age 14. I learned to drive an ambulance in the National Guard. That's where I learned to drive a 1945 Dodge three-quarter ton ambulance. And we drilled, as I said, once, uh, once a month on Monday evenings. And we did close order drill, learned how to do first aid since we were a medical battalion, learned how to do field dressings for emergency uh, things where people get shot or different things happen, you have to tend to them. In 1949, we went to Camp Polk, Louisiana and bivouac down there and on the way uh, spent the night, I think, in Texarkana and then went on from there to uh, Camp Polk, Louisiana or Fort Polk at that time. I celebrated my 15th birthday there and I learned at that time uh, how to mix uh, pure grain alcohol with grapefruit juice. and <laughs> Not a good experience for a 15 year old. Uh, when they issued us our uniforms, I assumed that they had them already tailored because I don't recall ever having to spend money to have the uniform tailored to fit me. Uh, it was the wool, dark brown or greenish brown wool and the, uh, with the Eisenhower jacket and the 39th Division patch on the arm. And I was, went in as a private and came out as a private, uh, mainly because I wasn't in long enough to do much. In 1950, when the war broke out, or the police action broke out in Korea, um, all the mothers of us enlistees who had enlisted fraudulently, as it turned out, uh, before we were of age, wrote letters to the commanding officer, and we were honorably discharged from the Arkansas National Guard. But for pay purposes in the military, I, I at that time was honored, and I received uh, the time in grade for that. The reason I went in the Navy, <clears throat> I had difficulties in high school. I, I was in a trade school and could not get to school on time. The principal or assistant principal uh, called me in her office and to begin the 11th grade and said, I'm going to suspend you until Mr. Scott, our principal, gets back in town. He was at a conference. And I said, no, you can't do that. I quit. So I quit high school at, in, uh, when I was 16 years old. When I was 17, my mother signed the papers for me to go in the Navy. And uh, I never registered. I was never became a, a uh, draft dodger because I enlisted, but I was never registered in the selective service either. I don't have a selective service number. I went in the Navy, as I said, when I was 17 on what they call a kitty cruise. You go in before your 18th birthday and your discharge date is the day before your 21st birthday which would have been August the 8th, 1955, I believe. So I went in the Navy at uh, age 17, January the 3rd, 1952, went to San Diego Naval Recruit 
center uh, in San Diego and had three months boot camp from January through March. Uh, a couple of memorable things happened while I was in the boot camp. Our <coughs> DI or commanding officer was uh, Chief Petty Officer. Chief Petty Officer, he was a quartermaster. His name was Griffith. He came into our barracks one day and said, men, we're going to go volunteer to give blood today. And it's strictly volunteer. You don't have to do it if you don't feel comfortable. But I've never had less than 100% participation. So at age 17, I learned to donate blood. And I'm over a 10-gallon donor now at, at uh, Carter. So it's something that has served me well, I think. Also, I was in, when I was in junior high school, I was in the marching band. I played drums. So I tried out for the drum and bugle corps in boot camp. And I learned rather rapidly that I was not a good drummer at all because <laughs> they said, show us some flamadiddles and paradiddles. And I said, show you what? And that, that's drum talk. Uh, I didn't make the drum and bugle corps in boot camp. So I went back to my regular company and graduated with them in March of 1952. <clears throat> I went home on boot leave in March and uh, to Little Rock and then uh, was there for 30 days and then transported back to San Francisco where I caught the USS Sitco Bay uh, to carry your transport, went to Yokosuka, Japan for a train trip south to Sasebo, Japan where I caught my ship, the USS Dixie destroyer tender and I was on the Dixie for four years and many experiences on there but uh, the reason that I went in the Navy was at age 16, I, I couldn't find myself or any particular thing that I wanted to do for a lifelong career. My mother was a single mother, had raised me up to that point, and I felt I was more of a burden on her than I should have been. And I asked her to sign the papers when I was 17 so I could go in the Navy, which she did. I had many experiences on the Dixie, which served me well in life. Uh, just a whole lot of things. that. Uh, kind of hard to enumerate all of them. One of the best things that happened, the first class petty officer that I worked for in the carpenter shop on the Dixie, uh, we were in Manila at the Philippines at the time. It was about 1956, I believe. Or no, it couldn't have been then. It was 1954, maybe. I had quit school and did not have my GED. And he said, if you don't go over and try to sit for your GED and get it, I'm going to restrict you to the ship in the States and the Philippines and Japan. I don't know if he could have done it or not, but he convinced me that he could. So I went over to the, uh, I guess it was the commanding officer's barracks or office on Manila and saw the chaplain and told him I wanted to sit for my GED and they made the arrangements and I sat and took all five tests in one day and passed all of them in the pretty high percentile. So thanks to that first class petty officer, I got my GED and it has served me well because it's every job and thing that I've done since exit from the service has required either a high school diploma or GED and I've had that. So that, that worked well for me. My rate in the Navy, <clears throat> excuse me, I was a damage controlman and aboard ship, that means anything that happens to that ship that requires repair or fixing uh, or discarding, whatever the case may be, we had to take care of. That included fire, flood, and learn how to decontaminate from uh, radiation from atomic bombs or oil spills, uh, fuel spills. Uh, at one point, we did have a mercury uh, spill we had to take care of and other things that would damage the ship. One of the things that we did when we did when we were underway between ports it was as damage control when we had to stand watch and take soundings on the ship. A sounding is just merely it's a there's a six inch plate in the deck with a three inch hole that has a screw in it. You screw take the screw out and you have a fifty foot tape <clears throat> with a plumb bob on the end. You let that down through the hole and let it hit bottom and then you crank it up slowly to find out the level of fluid in the void, whether it's water or oil or a mixture or whatever. And you have a clipboard with soundings that have taken throughout the watches before you and you compare yours with theirs. 
And if there's no notable difference, that's just fine. You go do your next sounding. We had them on the port side and the starboard side, fore and aft uh, on the Dixie, probably 30 soundings per watch. If you found one that was off by six inches or so, then you reported it. Well, as it happened one time, uh, one particular day, there was a sounding turned in that showed a foot difference in this one particular void. So our engineering officer asked for volunteers to go investigate, see what it was. I and another fellow uh, offered to do that. We opened the uh, hatch. It was dogged down pretty tightly. We opened that up and there was a ladder attached to the bulkhead that you climbed down in there. And it was had been used for oil storage and fuel oil storage at some point. And it was pretty, pretty gross. And it was the uh, salt water had been in there and it was just, we climbed down in the bottom. We had on oxygen breathing apparatuses because the air was too foul to breathe without it. We also had uh, spark proof lanterns that we carried with us because there's no lighting down there and uh, you can't carry just a regular drop, drop cord down there because of the possibility of a spark. As we got down there, there was, uh, we investigated and checked everything out. There was about six inches of water in the void and slippery with all the oil and everything. But uh, as it turned out, it was just a misreading on that person's part. Uh, probably the ship had listed too far to that side at one time when he had the, the probe down there or, or just he just misread it. So and long and short of that is we came back up and we were covered with slimy, oily, gooey mess. Uh, they took us out on deck and washed us down with inch and a half fire hoses, uh, the pressure reduced of course, and knocked all the oil and everything off of us and took our clothes and skivvies and everything, shoes, socks, and put them in a bag and just put them in the uh, discard because you, you couldn't wash them. And they did all that so we could get clean enough to go take a shower. And uh, in the Navy they have what they call a DC locker. Uh, if a piece of clothing is found and they can't find the owner, then they take a red D and D for discard of clothing, DC, and they stamp it on there across the person's name that uh, every piece of clothing you have is stenciled. And that marks that out and you, you can wear it yourself and put your own name tag on it at that point. So they gave us all clothing, pretty good clothing, it was all DC clothing. They weren't gonna give us anything new. So we had skivvies and shoes and socks and, and dungarees from that. So that was quite an experience. Uh, I served in, during the Korean conflict, police action war. Uh, at one point, we were sitting five miles off the coast of Korea, firing our little five inch guns and uh, there was a bigger ship behind us. I'm told it was Missouri, I'm not sure it was, but there was a bigger ship behind us putting 16 inch rounds over five, five miles behind us and we were five miles off, so 10 miles offshore and their, their 16 inch guns were coming over us, or 16 inch shells. Uh, it's a very interesting time in the Navy. I, I saw Beipu, Japan, Sasebo, Japan, Yokosuka, Japan, Pusan, Korea, Seoul, Korea, Manila, Philippines, Olonga, Pusan, Bali's in the Philippines. Uh, I think that's about all the ports I saw while I was aboard Dixie. Uh, I re-enlisted early on the Dixie in March of 1955 I was supposed to get out in August. I re-enlisted in March for another four years. And at, uh, at that point, we were in Sasebo. And I wound up being hospitalized with perforated ulcers shortly after that. I was sent to the Naval Hospital in Sasebo and they cured me in, the, in time to catch Dixie back to uh, the States. As a re-enlistment bonus, I was able to pick shore duty. Um, I, I had choice of three places. I picked San Francisco, San Diego, and another place. I don't remember where that was. I got my second choice. I was stationed at the Naval Air Station in San Diego for two years. First year I was on the docks. Uh, we did the crash boats for any aviator that uh, lost it and had to crash in the sea. Then we had to go out and rescue them. Fortunately, the year that I was on the crash boats, that never happened. So I, I never had to experience that. My second year at North Island, I was uh, assigned to be a galley master at arms. Galley master at arms, uh, well master at arms is the policeman 
on the station of where you happen to be. We had them aboard ship as well as uh, uh, North Island. The galley master at arms is in charge of the galley where all the food is prepared. And we are in charge, we, <laughs> they were in charge of the mess cooks. And a mess cook is a, a in the Army it's called KP, the Air Force is probably called KP as well, and the Marine Corps is probably KP, but then the Navy is called mess cooking, and you go there for three months. You assist the cooks and or the other people in the preparation of food. Uh, we had those made assignments as well as people that worked in the serving lines, as well as those that worked on the tables and keeping the milk machines supplied and just anything that replied, required manpower other than a cook, we furnished the people for that. So we had probably a crew of uh, 30 or 40 individuals and we made the assignments to them or for them and uh, kept the cooks happy with that. And then uh, TP is called table police. They, they were the ones that were responsible for taking care of the tables, making sure they had salt and pepper and napkins and, and the other nose and charging the milk machine to keep it supplied with uh, the five gallon milk containers so the guys could go up and help themselves. Didn't have that aboard ship, by the way. <laughs> we had powdered milk or, or canned milk until we got back into port. Uh, another thing that we did uh, in that particular galley is we prepared the uh, flight boxes, box lunches for flights for the next day. So uh, about 11 or 12 o'clock at night, they'd start cooking off the chicken and then making the sandwiches and whatever and pack, packing the uh, flight boxes. And at that time, they still put the four, four cigarette packs of cigarettes that all the tobacco companies gave and we put them in there with fruit and cookies, uh, two pieces of bread, a sandwich, and a piece of fried chicken. That was their box lunch. Well, if you worked that particular area and you came in late at night, there was a good place to get a good midnight snack. <laughs> or if you had friends, that if you think you had friends or they, they thought they were friends, they could probably come in and ride on your coattail and get a free meal too. But it was, it was an interesting experience. Uh, as I said, damage control in the Navy is, is uh, it's quite a responsibility. I learned some firefighting techniques in there that came in useful later. After my two years was up at North Island, my last year I was transferred to Guam, the Marianas Islands. I had heard horror stories about Guam. Everybody has their own little particular horror story about Guam. There's, uh, there's pretty girls behind every tree, but there's not a tree on Guam. Well, that's a lie. There's, there's lots of trees on Guam. I was stationed there a year. First, I was transferred to the uh, Duva Duva Naval Communication Station, radio station there. And then an opening came up down south of there at the Naval Magazine where they stored a lot of different types of bombs, ammunition and such, including nuclear warheads I found out at a later date. But I was in charge of the paint locker down there and I had uh, several Guamanian and Filipino natives working for me. We took care of all the buildings on site, uh, repainted them and also uh, all the vehicles on site, we took care of those as well. I was fortunate while I was there, there was a fellow that was leaving Guam and he sold me a 1928 Model A two-door roadster and for $50. I, being in the position I was in, I was very fortunate. Uh, there was two shops next to the paint shop. One was an electrical shop and one was a canvas shop. Well, my Filipinos took, uh, my Model A and took it down to bare metal, primed it and painted it in a real pretty black. The sail loft made me new seat covers out of terry cloth and new running boards and, and uh, mats in the interior of the Model A and then the, the electrician rewired the thing for me. Well, rewiring a Model A is not that tough, but it rewired the Model A. So in essence, I had an almost brand new Model A running around on Guam that I paid $50 for. I made second class petty officer while I was on Guam, which would entitle me when I got discharged to take any of my possessions with me that I wanted. And I could have brought that home and I did not. And I've always regretted not doing that. It was a, it was a honey of a car. But the experience on Guam was good. As I said, we had firefighting techniques taught as a damage controlman. I was on Liberty one evening 
with a bunch of fellas, a place we call the office. And it was a, a nice, quiet place for military folks to go to, uh, get a good steak dinner, baked potato and salad for about three bucks. And the drinks were well made as well. We were down there and a call came from the magazine for all hands to report back to the magazine. There was a fire in the perimeter and they needed it put out. So we reported back to the magazine and uh, gave us, uh, in my case, they gave us five pound or five gallon tanks on our backs with spray nozzles to go out and fight the perimeter fires. Just the small ones coming up to keep it from getting big and crossing the street and coming down in the magazine. If the fire had got on the magazine, it would have been a really disastrous situation. But as it was, we, we got it under control and stopped it. And uh, it was quite an experience. Uh, glad I don't have to do that today. And I take my hat off to any firefighter because they, they have a hard life, uh, a, a dangerous life, not particularly hard. They have a dangerous life and they do way more than people give them credit for. And my hat's off to them. Uh, the Coast Guard, I enlisted in the Coast Guard in 1961. Uh, a couple of fluky things happened there. I went in as a fireman, which is an E3 rating, instead of coming in through, I didn't get to go through boot camp because I had previous military experience. So I enlisted in Atlanta. They gave me orders to go to Miami and get my uniforms and sign in to the Coast Guard Commandant down there. I did that since I had a car, I had my own transportation. I drove down to Miami, got my uniforms. And at that time, the Coast Guard uniform was identical to the Navy uniform, except the Coast Guard wears a, a shield, a white shield on their cuff. Other than that, it's a Navy uniform. I got my uniforms and that was on Friday afternoon. They told me I had to spend the night or spend the weekend at the receiving station there. Uh, until I could get my uniforms tailored and then go to my next assignment, which is going to be Charleston, South Carolina. I asked if I could find a tailor to do it myself and leave Miami sooner. And they said, if you can, sure. So Friday afternoon, I was in civilian clothes driving around looking for a tailor shop. Couldn't find one. I found a, a seamstress or a, a drapery shop that was open and I showed the lady what I needed. She showed my patch on my shoulder, on my arm and hemmed my pants. So I went back to the base and showed them and they said, okay, you can go. So I drove two days early up to Charleston, South Carolina and reported in there. And Charleston Coast Guard Station is a pretty good sized station. It's probably 300 people. Not big by Navy standards, but Coast Guard standards, that's a big station. I was there about two weeks and we had a, a work job come up over in Sullivan's Island, which is about 12 miles east of Charleston and it's a Sullivan's Island lifeboat station and just what it says it's a it was a lifeboat station that used to go out and rescue uh, ships and people on ships that had uh, run aground or started sinking off off the coast uh, as I said I was I was a, a fireman striking for damage control well, I found out in the Coast Guard that damage control is totally different than in the Navy. Uh, in the Coast Guard, damage control at that point was more of an engineman's rating, uh, dealing with engines and, and things of that stripe. In the, in the Navy, the, the Coast Guard is, uh, I mean, it, the damage control in the Navy is all about uh, saving the ship, uh, working in disastrous situations to rectify anything that happens. So. At one point, uh, I decided that I would like to be at that station. So we got back to the uh, main station in, in uh, Charleston and I asked them if there's any chance of transferring to Sullivan's Island. And as it happened, they said there was an opening that they had requested a person to come to Sullivan's Island. So I put in for it and was transferred over there. Uh, it was a 12 station, a 12 man station and all of our efforts were put into, as most co all Coast Guard is, all our efforts are put into life-saving. I uh, like that about the Coast Guard above the Navy or any other service in that their number one job in the Coast Guard is s rescue, total life-saving rescue if possible, or search and rescue if necessary. So while I was there, <coughs> 
we had a cook that was not a very good cook and in the coast at that particular station uh he would go to we, we would go to buy groceries down there at the grocery store just like a housewife and uh the cook was operating on a dollar 25 i think a day per person for for rations and he was off on the weekends so on the uh, friday afternoon he'd make sure that there was cube steak and easily prepared meals uh, that we could fix for ourselves as i said he wasn't a well-liked person so someone came up with the idea that if we cooked everything that he had in the freezer and everything we could probably run him out of budget and he would get in trouble and get fired or replaced so it came up in conversation that I had previous cooking experience. So I was assigned to volunteer to do it. So we did that. With the weekend we had cube steaks and T-bone steaks and roasts and just everything he had we cooked and ate. Didn't, didn't waste anything. Monday morning about 10 o'clock the commanding officer called me to his office. He said, uh, I understand you did some cooking over the weekend. I said, yes sir. I can't lie to a man. So, and our at that time, our, our uh, commanding officer was a W-2 warrant officer. He said, well, <clears throat> I've got a question for you. He says, Can you, could you cook for the station if we ask you to? I said, yes, sir, I could. He said, well, good. Our cook has turned himself into the Naval Psychiatric Ward in Savannah, Georgia. He's had a breakdown, and we need somebody to take his place until we can get a replacement. I said, I'll be glad to do that, sir, but it, I'll have to be relieved of all other watch duties. I don't want to do his job and, and have to stand watches as well. He said, no problem, we can do that. So that's what we did. And the commanding, uh, the uh, executive officer came in to me while I was in the galley. He said, you know, you could probably make commissariamen first and second class or second class and first class real easy. It's a wide open rate. I said, but I'm a fireman. He said, we can change that with just a letter. Change your designation to seaman, and then you can work towards being a commissaryman. I said, okay. So we did that. I got the designation as seaman, and then I uh, requested and got the study guides for commissaryman third, commissaryman second, commissaryman first, and commissaryman chief. I did all of those, and then I went over to uh, the Coast Guard Station in Charleston, for my practicals. They had six cooks over there, I believe, and they put me through the paces for a commissary. And said, how do you do this? How do you do this? Prepare this, do this. So I did all that over a week's period of time, and I came back. I was the damage, or a <laughs> commissary in third class in the Coast Guard, and then I made second class within, I think, three or four months because it was a wide open rate. And uh, with my seniority and everything and I had it started making good money as a, as a commissary man and uh, it was a good life I was at Solomon's Island when they built the last life uh, lighthouse on United States property or in, in, within the continental limits of the United States in 1962 it was uh, a very radical design it was built in a triangular shape as opposed to cylindrical and it was made out of metal to be hurricane proof instead of bricks and mortar and it's the only lighthouse ever constructed with the elevator in it and the elevator was to access the million candle uh, candle power light up there when it needed service which has been reduced to 750,000 candle power because the residents of Solomon's Island didn't like the light shining in their houses so that was quite an experience as well and uh, I have since gone back to Sullivan's Island in, I think, in 2000 uh, to see the barracks and everything, and that's been turned over to the Park Service for their use as barracks for the families, family living. But the lighthouse is still there, and it's painted black and white. It still does its job very well. It's called the New Charleston Light, but uh, to me, it's always be Sullivan's Island. I was involved in two rescues at Sullivan's Island. One of them. <coughs> Uh, two people, a uh, young young couple, uh, swamped their boat off Dewey's Island, which is a little island a few miles off of uh, Sullivan's Island. Uh, first class bosun mate, I uh, don't remember his name now, uh, got the boat, and I was his uh, bowman, and we took off and, and uh, got out to Dewey's Island and found the capsized boat, and it was a young couple, as I said. And, 
and got them aboard and wrapped them up in blankets and took them to shore. And uh, their father met us at the at the dock and uh, subsequently gave us a letter of commendation uh, in our package. But I've, I've lost it over the years, unfortunately. Second rescue I was involved in had a tragic outcome <clears throat> due to the American Red Cross lifeguards, not us. We got a call. Uh, well, let me back up a little. In the Coast Guard, if you're on station, whether you are on duty or not assigned to duty, if you're on station, you are on duty as far as a rescue goes. As it happened, this particular Sunday, I was the second class petty officer. I was on station, but I wasn't on duty, but a rescue came in, so I was senior petty officer in charge. I grabbed all the hands that were there, it was one, <laughs> and he drove uh, the pickup. We had a, a boat attached to the pickup. We went up to uh, Isle of Palms, which is seven miles up the coast on a highway. There was a family of seven people in the water. The boat had capsized and they were uh, in peril. We got to Isle of Palms and uh, didn't even have to launch the boat. They were in very shallow water. So we got out uh, of, the, of the pickup and uh, ran to the shore and started getting in the water and getting the people out. Some people there had already rescued some of them and got them out. Uh, the biggest thing we had was a 47 year old white male, the uncle of uh, six of the, uh, the other six people. He was in, in uh, desperate straits. So we, we got him out. As it happened, a third class petty officer named Priester who had just reported aboard was on liberty at, at uh, Isle of Palms and saw the situation and jumped in and helped us. And uh, we started administering mouth to mouth resuscitation to this gentleman. And uh, it's not experience. I want to repeat that's that's the repercussions, the repercussions are, are pretty gross. But we were administering mouth to mouth to this gentleman and uh, at one point had him breathing. And then the uh, Red Cross lifeguard decided he needed external heart massage. So he started doing CPR and his method and uh, we later found out that he ruptured the man's heart from the uh, force that he was using. So we saved six of those people and uh, I'll always admire the Coast Guard for their uh, efforts that they do in life saving and rescue and what they do in today's world is just is phenomenal. and. Uh, they have a saying, all go out, but not all come back. And that, that's true sometimes, but that's my experiences. Uh, so far, you have any questions? Tell us a little bit about uh, the Dixie. And the Dixie was a destroyer that. tender, it's a designation of AD-14. Uh, this is the one I was on, was commissioned in 1939, launched in 1940. She was decommissioned in 1982. Uh, Destroyer tender is uh, a ship that sits at anchor or at a buoy or whatever, and then destroyers, which are smaller ships, tie up alongside for uh, repairs. And on the destroyer tender, you have a complement of about 1,200 men. 700 are ship's company, which I was, means we take care of everything that happens aboard the Dixie, woodworking, metal, framing, uh, welding, pipe cutting, just anything that needed to be done to restore or maintain the Dixie. The other 500 people are in the repair division, it's the, the fifth division called repair, and they share the same shops that ship's company does. They have carpenter shops, welding shops, pipe shops, metal shops, uh, anything that requires repair on the tin cans. So we work hand in hand. Uh, sometimes the ship's company helped the repair guys if they had a big job and vice versa. But primarily we were assigned to the Dixie for the, maintain the upkeep of the Dixie and the repair department took care of the tin cans. And we, we would have as many as five or six tied up along the port side. There's always tied port side. And if you were, if they, if they were working on the one that was the furthest over, then they had to cross with all of their equipment and the repair stuff. They had to cross five other ships to get to the one that was furthest outboard. Uh, I'm assuming I never got to go that part of it. But I'm assuming that they used 
the furthest out for the least damage and then work their way in for the most serious damage being the one tied up alongside us. Uh, but it's, uh, they had, we had divers, uh, carpenters, pipe fitters, metal workers, engine men, quartermasters, uh, machinist mates, every rate you can think of aboard Dixie, the repair department also had. And uh, it, it was quite an operation. And we, as I said, we had 1,200 men, and we had to, they, those all had to be fed on Dixie, and we also provided uh, stuff for the other ships tied up alongside as far as supplies go, uh, ammunition, oil, foodstuffs, uh, and we had a bakery on the ship, so we did a lot of, had a lot of bread, fresh bread and uh, good things like that. But the sailors you served with, any uh, notable uh, individuals that you remember? Other than that first class that told me to go get my GED, you know, there's a lot of good guys. I saw some come, some go. Uh, never had any lasting relationships or friendships with any. Just, uh, I don't know why that is in the Navy, but just some guys in the Navy have long lasting relationships. I don't, I didn't have, and uh, I, I regret that really. What were your impressions of the officers? By and large, we had a great group of officers. As, uh, one that I wasn't particularly fond of, and I don't think he knew his job, but the Navy commissioned him, so I can't say that he was wrong for the job. How'd you stay in touch with your family? Well, <laughs> my birthday in 19... I guess 55, right after I re-enlisted, we were in Japan, and somehow they had a shore-to-shore -shore hookup, and my mother called me on my birthday, and that was, that was pretty special, because at that time, it cost her $12 a minute to make a call like that. Uh, we didn't have email, of course, or uh, no computers, no Skype or any of that, just uh, letters, and uh, <clears throat> if you were out to sea, we, one time we were out to sea for 30 days, we didn't have any mail, of course. So we pulled into port, and uh, there's a pretty good backlog of, of mail to be read and looked over at that time. But uh, probably a letter would take, under normal circumstances, I'm saying probably a week to 10 days from the time you mailed it to the time we got it, or vice versa, depending on whether we had a place to drop mail or not. The good thing about being in Korea, Korean waters, was our mail was free. We didn't have to pay to mail anything out. It was uh, uh, a perk of being in a war zone. What was the food like? We had good, good, we had good food. Uh, a lot of people call cooks belly robbers, and I guess that's a good designation for them. Uh, again, on the Dixie, we had good mess cooks. That's, uh, as I explained a while ago, a mess cook is the guy that helps the cook. And uh, at one point, I was in mess cooking. and. But the spud locker is where they prepare all the potatoes, just what it says, it's a spud locker. They prepare all the potatoes for all the meals. And the cooks do a remarkable job. The only thing they don't know how to do is make decent coffee. They, they have a 55 gallon steam pot, I call them, and they put the water in there and get it to boil, and then they have a like a tow sack or a gunny sack. They'd uh, put coffee grounds in it and throw it in there and let it boil a while and take it out. Well. <laughs> I like boiled coffee as much as the next guy if I'm on the riverbank, but I don't like it. So they don't know how to make good coffee. I don't know if the officers had any better or not, but it, different mess altogether. I don't know. But the, by and large, the food that we had was great. It really was. How about your supplies? Were you well supplied? Very well supplied. The Dixie had a, uh, well, she was 560 feet long. So she had a pretty good sized reefer down under. Uh, the decks down in the second and third decks down and big reefers and big freezers so we always had a good supply of we didn't run out of anything except fresh milk and that you can freeze just so much but uh, and I'm not a big milk drinker anyhow but a lot of guys were but yeah the, the supplies and uh, well supplied very well supplied ammunition uh, we, we supplied ammunition for a bunch of ships it, one of the most interesting things I saw was a uh, ship pulled up beside us uh, out in the Korean waters, uh, needing needing uh, fuel oil, so they have uh, the deck people do this. I wasn't involved in this. I I watched and was just amazed. But they they have a uh, kind of like a flare gun thing. They they shoot a, a missile over 
with a line attached to it and the ship catches it and then pulls it in. It's attached to a little bit bigger line and then they keep hauling that in, put it on a winch and then it's attached to a hawser which is a big old thick rope about like that. And then they tie these ships, uh, tether them together probably 40 or 50 feet apart. They're both of them moving in the water like this and adjusting their rate of uh, flow. And then they uh, attach to that, they have these big old oil lines about this big around that they send over on another line. And then they attach it to the ship and then they pump oil from one to the other, all the time maintaining the distance, at keeping a slack in the lines and the oil lines and doing the same thing with ammunition. And we've also transferred uh, foodstuffs to other ships when they need supplies. Uh, it's an amazing operation how they do it. I, I take my hat off to them because, uh, you know, you say a decade, all he does is, is paint and swab. That's not true. They do a bunch of heroic things. Any uh, stress that you noticed? Uh, one day. We had 12 general quarter calls in a 24-hour period. I was pretty well stressed out over that, but uh, by and large, there's no stress. You don't have time. If you're doing your job, which we did, we were, uh, we were kept busy and don't have time for stress. I didn't have time for stress. Any other comments about uh, your experiences close to Korea there in the combat situations there? <sighs> Not really. I, I I got the combat medal, and I didn't know Mr. Marchant, Kenny Marchant got that for me recently. I did not know I was entitled to it, uh, just being in the combat area. But as far as being on shore or uh, involved in that way, no, just uh, in support of the other Navy vessels there, and uh, I guess our presence there had some, some effect. How did you entertain yourself? Did a lot of reading. Uh, you're not supposed to gamble in the Navy, but we had poker games. Uh, they weren't sanctioned by any stretch of the imagination, but they still happened. Uh, we learned how to play pinochle, and that can be a very interesting game. If you're playing for a penny a point, dollar a set, and dollar a game, it gets expensive. <laughs> uh, at one point, uh, we had a little hobby shop developed aboard ship, and I got into making plastic models. Uh, tr uh, old automobile models, old truck models, and things of that nature, and, and uh, didn't keep them. I, I guess uh, they fell in the hands of somebody's kids. I hope they enjoyed them. I did a little leather working. Uh, didn't have many supplies, but had a couple of tools where you can do the embossing and then uh, the lacing up of stuff like that. But uh, a lot of reading, mostly reading and then card playing. Did you see any USO shows? No, we did not have privy to that. Uh, I guess they figured since we were six months, six to nine months out of the States and six to nine months in the States that we weren't that uh, needy for entertainment. We did have movies every night aboard ship up on the, uh, if it was a pretty night up on the boat deck, uh, they had the big screen and they had uh, a lot of first run movies. Uh, saw a lot of musicals and the, <laughs> What tickled me is you have guys that they know this is a musical, they know the hero is going to sing, the girl's going to sing, and yet they start singing and rah, 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 you really razzed them. So a little bit uh, upsetting to me. I wasn't happy with that, but uh, I like a good musical. And it's a free movie, so you know, you, you go with the flow. Well, tell me a little <clears throat> bit about uh, from the Navy into the Coast Guard. How did you choose, or why did you choose the Coast Guard after the Navy? Well, I got out of the Navy in 59, and uh, through several circumstances, I wound up in Atlanta, and uh, things were not going well for me and my wife at that time. Uh, she was pregnant and going back to Little Rock to be with her mother and father for delivery, and I was at, rather at loose ends, so I said, okay, uh, I'm going back into service. I think I'd be a better place for that, and there was a Coast Guard recruiting station very close to where I worked, so I walked down there and talked to him, and it, it appealed to me. So uh, I had been in the Navy and enjoyed it. Had they asked me in '59 when I got out at Treasure Island, if they had asked me to reenlist, I probably would have. They didn't, and I didn't. So uh, 
I would wondered about the Coast Guard. My stepfather and my mother had married in 1945, 46, was in the Coast Guard, and I didn't know a great deal about it, so I wanted to investigate it. I liked what I saw, so I went in. Well, tell me a little bit about the day that uh, your service ended, that uh, you were done with the military. What were your thoughts? Wow. That's going back a long time, John. Uh, in 1959, I was at Treasure Island in San Francisco Bay, and that's where I was discharged from the Navy. As I said, had they asked me to re-enlist, I probably would have, but they didn't, so I went over after I got my discharge papers and everything. A friend of mine lived in San Francisco, a friend of mine from Little Rock, and I went over and spent some time with him. and. Uh, maybe a week or so and just hung out and uh, at loose ends didn't have any ties or connections to San Francisco other than I loved the city but I didn't have any prospects of employment or anything like that so I went back to Little Rock and stayed with my mother and stepdad for a short period of time and then uh, got involved in uh, got out in February I believe it was March or early April, I was hired by National Shirt Shops and in Little Rock. And I like that. I was in retail sales, men's sales. And uh, then I transferred to Atlanta with National Shirt Shops to be assistant manager at Lenox Square, National Shirt Shops at Lenox Square. And then uh, brought my wife down from a Little Rock and uh, set up a housekeeping there. And then uh, went in the Coast Guard in 61. My last day in the Coast Guard was uh, not too impactful. I, I don't remember a great deal about it. Just I was in radio station in Jacksonville Beach, Florida at the time and uh, drove from there back to Little Rock and just learned how to play the harmonica while I was driving. <laughs> and entertain yourself as best you can. What'd you do after the Coast Guard? Uh, after the Coast Guard, first job I had was at Dixon Dairy <clears throat> for a short period of time, and that didn't last too well because they wanted me on the route at three o'clock in the morning, and I never could get up before five, so it didn't last very long. I went to work then for it's in 1963. I went to work with my stepdad as a construction helper, and we were putting in acoustical ceilings at the time in uh, buildings. And then I went from there into a beer route with uh, Falstaff, and I liked that. And then uh, went in from there, I went into uh, selling insurance, I believe it was, with American National Life Insurance Company. And in 1964, I moved to Dallas, right after, it was a year after Kennedy was shot. So I've, I've been in sales all my life. There's always been a say, well, he could sell icebox to Eskimos. He can, but I, I can sell him the ice to put in the icebox. So you're in the insurance business? Yes, for quite, I was in the insurance business for eight years, uh, off and on. The last eight years before I went with American Airlines was in uh, insurance business. Well, tell me a little bit about American Airlines. What did you do there? I started out on the ramp, what they call a ramp rat, a fleet service clerk. Uh, works all handling baggage, mail, uh, and all that good stuff. And then I went from there. I was there about uh, 18 months. And then I transferred over to our bid in to the uh, cargo building where they processed all the cargo in and out uh, and stayed there until I injured my back in 1979. I was on disability for three years and I came back and uh, I was fleet service until 1989 and opening came up as a cargo agent which is uh, like an airport agent only works in cargo and I applied for that, did the interview process, and uh, the Lord blessed me and, and made it possible for me to become a cargo agent. I was a cargo agent from eight, 1989 until uh, 
1990, I believe, an opening came up at headquarters for meeting planning services agent. Would just be a lateral transfer if I got approved. I went over there and interviewed for that. And again, the Lord blessed me. I got that job. So I was at headquarters from 1990 until 1992. Then American, in its wisdom, closed our sales office and transferred five of us to Southern Sales uh, out in North Irving. And the other five, the other 20 people went back to their original assignment at the Southern Reservation Office. I was blessed in that I didn't have to go back to cargo because I would have booted somebody out of theirs and they would have gone to snowball down. So they, they let me go with the other four people over to sales. Uh, and then that lasted from 92 to 94, I believe it was. I was had a special job in audits and then they closed that sales office because it wasn't to do all, be all that they thought it was going to be. So I transferred back to headquarters working for a lady and I maintained my position in audits. And I was there until December of 1994 when I retired. They came out with a package in October of 94. They would add five years to my job, to my uh, seniority and five years to my age on paper, which would qualify me for Americans uh, retirement package. I went and talked to the lady at HR. I said, well, show me. So she showed me on paper where I could make as much money not going to work as I could going to work and not having to pay all the other excess of social security taxes and everything. So I said, I, I'll take that. She said, okay. I said, when's the earliest I can do that? She said, December the 1st. I said, okay, would you call my manager and tell me? She said, no, you have to call your manager and tell her. So I called my well, first I called my boss's boss and told him, I said, uh, I'm right. I'm retiring December the 1st. He said, you can't do that. I said, yes, I can. I've already got the papers in, in, in. I'm just, I'm giving you a courtesy call that I'm retiring. He said, have you told Ginger? I said, no, I'm going to call Ginger now. And I called her. You can't do that. I said, yes, ma'am, I can. I told John, I'm telling you, my papers are in. I'm retiring December the 1st, 1994. Thank you very much. For 21 and a half years later, I retired. Americans are a great company. Uh, their bankruptcy proceedings they're going through now with a merger with U.S. Air. I'm sorry to see it, but I think it may be the best thing for all involved. And uh, I just hope that the, the, the people it's affecting will not be a bad thing for them because there's a lot of good people at American, a lot of good people. Did you join any uh, veteran service organizations? Did not. I have looked at BFW. Uh, and uh, American Legion doesn't really appeal to me. The VFW, Veterans of Foreign Wars, does to some extent. But um, I was Santa Claus at a VFW one year as a volunteer. And what they do for the kiddos is a good thing. I'm not really sure they do a great deal for veterans other than having a place for them to, to gather and uh, do a lot of partying. And uh, I'm, just, I'm not into that. As we think about uh, your military experience, uh, how did it influence your thinking about war and military personnel and the military in general, having served? My hat's off to what the guys are doing, guys and girls, of course, what they're doing now. Uh, it's a different world than it was when I was in. Uh, it's a different world than it was in World War II. World War II, you knew who the enemy was. Vietnam, they weren't sure because you know, she might work for your patio today and shoot you at night or have a bomb strapped to her and her kid might be with her and the same thing and I'm not really sure you know that our guys have a good chance over in Afghanistan I mean we're training their people to be policemen and Afghan soldiers and they're turning around and shooting our guys and bombing them and uh, they have a, they have a hard way to go right now I admire what they do I love them for what they do my hat's off to them. I salute every one of them, down to the lowest grunt to the highest commander. And I just pray that we can have a, an end to this at some point and give, give our troops the honor and medical stuff that they need because they're not being served properly right now, I don't feel. And I think Kenny's doing a good job in that. How did your service and experiences affect your life? <sighs> Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> how did it affect my life? It gave me a deep respect for uh, what others do, the military, the police, the fire, uh, what people do in their lives for a livelihood, uh, especially what, you know, for seeing somebody run in a building when they're just on fire and everybody else running out. I've seen things on TV these past few weeks, a guy, a neighbor just breaks in a window and gets a kid out because nobody else is there to do it. Uh, people lifting cars off of motorcycle accident victims. Uh, for war, it's, I think war is a, a nasty thing. It's, 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 I don't know who said it years ago, war is hell. It is. War is hell. I'm sorry it has to happen. It's been happening for eons ever since Cain killed Abel. So <laughs> that's the nature of the beast, I suppose. My personal feelings, uh, I support the death penalty for those that deserve it. I think if a jury of a person's peers says that they're guilty and the punishment is death, and that you know that's I've sat on juries where we did that. So uh, is my military influence? I don't know. I don't know. My military has influenced the way I feel about rescue. I think rescue is a, in the Coast Guard. We did rescue. Uh, rescue takes place every day. So I don't know if that answers your question. Well, Lee, is there anything else you'd like to add? I thank the Library of Congress for wanting to do this. I thank Kenny Marchant for uh, allowing me to do this. I appreciate your efforts. I know as his aide that you do a lot behind the scenes that probably are not recognized for, and I appreciate that. Uh, it's a chance to tell my story. I've put a lot of this on paper. I've made copies of uh, CDs to give them to my kids to read. I don't know if they have yet or not. Hopefully they will see this and get some idea of, of what their dad did. Uh, and it shows me warts and all. That's fine, too. I'm, I'm a human. Well, Lee, I want to thank you for coming in. On behalf of Congressman March and the United States, we want to thank you for your service. We appreciate what you did. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.